All right. So announcements as usual. Uh, the first uh, announcement is that uh, the midterm grade midterms are graded. Uh, you should have gotten a message maybe about five minutes back uh, with your grade. You can check later. It's going to be there. Don't worry. Uh, um, some statistics here. I don't know if it really matters, but uh, um, well, a few interesting surprises for me were that grads and undergrads did basically the same. And the different exams, that uh, different colored exams that you had were all statistically uh, uh, the same uh, according to some t-tests. Um, you should be able to see your grades on uh, Canvas. Uh, we, we, are, we created the whole thing using Gradescope. So if you have any regrade requests, feel free to um, you, you know, use its internal mechanism and we'll try to get, uh, get back to you ASAP. And then there is uh, also the homework, homework five that's due this Friday. Uh, this is a quiz on Canvas. You get two attempts and it covers boosting and ensembles. And uh, there's been a few hiccups with respect to what you see after your first attempt. Um, the intention was that you see which questions you got wrong. Um, I think that is the case now, at least after some tweaks that I made this morning. Um, if that doesn't happen, uh, if you can't see your mistakes after the first attempt, let us know. We'll continue struggling with Canvas trying to fix it. Uh, and then there's a project milestone that is, uh, if you've been paying attention to the thing on Canvas, you probably know about this, but uh, it is, uh, this is a milestone that's due April 11th. For this, you'll need to have uh, two more submissions to Carol and another small report. On Canvas, uh, it does not have to be really large. You, know, you don't need to write fancy prose, just a list of bullet points is good enough uh, that talks about what you've done since the previous update, any problems that you've been facing, and uh, what are your plans going ahead uh, for the final three submissions that will be due at the end of the semester, by the end of the semester, rather. Any questions, uh, either in person or remote, on any of these things? Probably not. Yeah. If you want to talk about it, we can chat about it offline or something. Yeah. This is the largest Zoom participation we've had. So, any questions on Zoom? All right, if there are no questions, uh, and in case uh, uh, you joined up late, the short version of the announcements are that the midterm grades are available. You should be able to see them on Canvas. Homework 5 is due this Friday, and then there's a project milestone that's due on April 11th. That would probably make it Tuesday next week, I think. Um, if there are no questions, I'm going to take us back to uh, stochastic gradient descent for support vector machines. And we'll continue from where we left off. Ah, there is a question. When we submit a project milestone, if I submitted two submissions in the first milestone, will one submission for the second milestone work? Yeah, that'll be fine. We need to see three submissions, uh, three distinct submissions uh, uh, by the time this milestone is due. Yeah. All right. So I want to uh, continue go back to. Uh, SVMs. In the last lecture, we were talking about training an SVM uh, by optimizing it. And the uh, topics that we intended to cover through yeah, at the end of last lecture and today is a quick review of uh, convex functions and gradient descent and so on. So we basically looked at what convex functions were in the last lecture. And I'll quickly just remind you what we saw. Um, a function is convex if uh, uh, f, let's say, let's call it f. Function is convex if for any inputs in the domain of the function and for any value of 
lambda between 0 and 1. If you apply the function to the convex combination of those two inputs, convex combination is just a way of saying uh, lambda u plus 1 minus lambda v in this case. If you apply the function to that point, the function value is going to be less than the convex combination of the uh, uh, values of the function at u and v. So f of lambda u plus 1 minus lambda v is less than or equal to lambda times f of u plus 1 minus lambda f of x. And if you want a picture, it looks something like this. Uh, this is u and f of u, and this is v and f of v. Just saying that this point is above this point here. And we kind of uh, spent a bit of time talking about this. So I want to uh, revisit that exact uh, thing. Another way of thinking about this, and this becomes somewhat useful when we want to think about uh, this concept of subgradient, is that for a convex function, every tangent plane or hyperplane lies entirely below the function. So at any point, if you draw something like a tangent like this line here, it lies entirely below the function. And that's another equivalent definition of convexity, which it turns out becomes useful later on. Um, there's a question. Do we care about parts of functions that are convex or uh, and parts that aren't? Or is the entire function either convex or uh, not? So let's uh, come back to the question just uh, uh, in a minute. So uh, there are many interesting functions that are convex. Linear functions are convex. It turns out linear functions are the only functions that are both convex and concave. The opposite of convex is concave, where uh, every tangent lies above the function. Uh, for our purposes, an interesting convex function is going to be the function of max, uh, function that is max of 0, comma x, actually max of anything, comma anything is going to give us a convex function. And sort of a useful parlor trick, if you, kind of, if you hang out in the kind of parlors that I do, is to be able to prove that uh, functions are convex. And uh, to do that, you can do that by using the first principles, using the definition of convexity. Uh, but the most common way to show that a function is convex is you take the second derivative of the function. If it's a function of one variable, then you get a number and you show that that number is positive. Uh, in general, if it's a function of a vector or if it's a function of uh, more than one input, then you get a matrix. A second derivative is actually a, uh, a matrix of partial derivatives. And you need to show that that matrix is positive semi-definite. And that's like a way of showing that a function is convex. OK, uh, you know, if this was all there was, then uh, life would be too simple. Turns out not all functions are convex. The exact opposite of a convex function is a concave function where the inequality changes sign. Um, and you know, if you have a function that's convex, you put a minus sign in front of it, you get a concave function. And going to the question that Jackson asked, there are functions that are neither convex nor concave, like x cubed. So this function here uh, looks like x cubed, or it like, looks like a cube, if you will. It has these two parts, where one part looks convex and another part looks concave. and um, the question that came up was, do we care or do we, is it okay if only certain parts of the uh, function are convex? It turns out convexity is a very useful property. Uh, if you have a convex function, in general, let, you know, let's go back to calculus uh, uh, one or something like that, where if you want to show that a certain point in the input of a function is the minimum, then you need to equivalently, uh, the necessary condition is that uh, its gradient is zero. So if it's a minimum, then the gradient is zero. For convex functions, and only for convex functions, this condition is both necessary and sufficient. So it's enough if you find a point that has zero gradient, that point is going to be the minimum of the function. It's guaranteed to be the minimum of the function. And this is only true for functions that are convex everywhere in their input. And that's why we're going to use, uh, that's why it's mighty convenient that the SVM objective, it turns out, is convex. Because then we can just find the minimum of that objective. Because remember, we are learning by optimization. We are minimizing that objective function. We can find the minimum of that objective by taking, finding a point where the gradient is zero. This is the SVM optimization problem that uh, we have seen, uh, I think we saw last week. 
that's the objective that needs to get minimized. That objective is a convex function in uh, W. Um, standard, you know, you can show that it's convex using sort of by building up standard uh, properties of con uh, convexity. The quadratic function is convex. So W transpose W is simply, simply something like this, W I square. Uh, it's quadratic, that's convex. The sum of two convex functions is convex, but before we even go there, this is linear. In fact, this whole thing is linear. Linear functions are convex. Max is a convex function. Convex function applied to another convex function is convex. Turns out summing convex functions gives us convex functions. This is also a sum multiplying by constant. At every step, we're just kind of making, uh, uh, we are preserving convexity. So this whole objective is convex. Now, let's look at this objective again. This objective is, a, is something called a quadratic optimization problem. It's called a quadratic optimization problem because if you think about, so if you stare at this, you'll notice that this is a degree two polynomial. So the objective is quadratic. So it's a quadratic optimization problem. It's also convex. So in theory, this is all that is needed to uh, for us to give, take, uh, off the shelf solver and make it somebody else's problem. And in particular, there is a line of work called quadratic programming, which seeks to optimize, minimize quadratic uh, objectives. And in theory, you can just use that. Turns out it's super slow. Uh, using off the shelf quadratic programming is very slow for this. Some of you, I believe, have taken classes on optimization, and you might be, you might have seen. Uh, uh, how to optimize uh, these sorts of things. Essentially, you, you compute, like you can use something like a Newton's method or something like that. Even if you use just simple gradient descent, turns out this objective is uh, kind of slow to minimize. We've seen gradient descent before. So let's, uh, uh, before we go to gradient descent, the reason gradient descent is a valid uh, algorithm here is because this is a convex function. For convex function, all we need is to find a point that has zero gradient. So if we keep going down the gradient of this function, we'll eventually come to a point that has zero gradient. And so uh, that's a necessary and sufficient condition and we are done. Yes. Uh, that's called gradient ascent. Yeah, it's like climbing the hill rather than going to the valley. That's exactly the, um, yeah, it's a standard technique. Or if you've already written a lot of code for gradient descent and you don't want to have accidental uh, negations or something like that, you take your objective function and just negate the objective. You get a convex function, you do gradient descent. Yeah. So, rather, so let's maybe look at, uh, before we talk about the fact that gradient descent is slow and such things, quick uh, reminder of gradient descent. We've seen this, uh, this before. Uh, it's a general strategy for minimizing a function. Um, in this case, today, we are minimizing this function here. J of W, J is a function that uh, for every point, every weight vector, you get a number. So that's the objective value. The goal is to find that weight vector that has the lowest objective value. So the way you do that is you start with some initial guess of the weights. And in this picture here, the horizontal axis is really uh, represents a vector. So every point in the horizontal axis, it, it looks like a single number, but pretend that you know it's like a higher dimensional. It's all the dimensions of the weights compressed into a single line. So we start off with some point and we can find uh, at that point, we can ask what's the gradient of that function? which direction the gradient intuitively is asking, which direction does the function grow the fastest uh, locally? I mean, uh, sitting around, uh, just, you know, looking around the function around at an infinitesimal uh, region around that point that we currently are on, which direction is the function growing the fastest? Let's say in this case, this function is growing the fastest. It's going at the tangent line point this way, which means the right, the direction, the change to W that makes the function increase is this way. Gradient descent says you take a step in the opposite direction 
to go from W0 to W1. So at, at every step, we compute the gradient of the function at the current uh, point that we have, WT. And then you update WT to get WT plus one by taking a step in the opposite direction to the gradient. And you can keep doing that till you come to a point where you've run out of time or you're uh, satisfied with the tolerance. The, every, the next step is going to be so small in magnitude that it really does not matter taking that step. You're kind of, you, def, you declare convergence. And we've seen this before. We've seen this for um, least mean square regression. It's the same idea. At least the, the objective for LMS regression is also convex. So gradient descent, we could in theory have applied gradient descent for uh, support vector machines where we initialize some weights and you compute uh, at every step, you compute the gradient of this function J. The J again is this whole thing here. And uh, you compute the gradient, you call that the gradient of the, this should be WT here, the gradient of WT and then uh, uh, of J at WT. And then you update the weights to get the new uh, weight WT plus one. Along the way, you have to decide on what a step size is. Uh, here I've just written R. It could, you know, there are standard uh, thing, techniques for picking step sizes. This, none of this should be particularly surprising or shocking. Hopefully, this looks very familiar. In fact, this slide is essentially identical to the one that we saw for least mean square regression, except for what's inside this box. Questions about gradient descent? It's always good to see, if you've not seen this before, it's always good to see these things more than once. Yes. Uh -huh. So for the sake of uh, the people on Zoom, the, I'll repeat the question. The second term here, this is a very good observation. The second term here, namely this one, right, uh, is a max of zero comma something. So it looks something like maybe this expression here. Uh, I've drawn it much more smoothly than it is. If you zoom in to this thing, at this point here, it's going to be uh, not differentiable. So how can we compute a gradient? That's an excellent question. We'll come back to that point, question when we talk about subgradient. But for now, pretend that there's something that we can do. There's something we can do to get an estimate of the gradient or something that looks behaves like the gradient. But yeah, uh, in standard gradient descent, you assume that your function is also differentiable everywhere. We're going to relax that and we are, we will say we want our function to be sub-differentiable. Turns out that's all we need. Okay, so let's talk about stochastic gradient descent. Uh, unfortunately, computing the gradient of uh, the SVM objective, even if you, pretend that the gradient of this expression here can be computed. Computing the gradient of J requires us to take the derivative of this. So I'll just do it quickly. So I have to take the gradient with respect to W of W transpose W plus three times the sum uh, gradient of the max term. Right, And this summation is over the entire data. So to get one estimate of the gradient, you need to do, if you, if you naively implement this, the summation there is uh, naively implemented a for loop over the entire data. You have to iterate over, you have to touch every data point to get one update to your weight vector. And this makes the whole thing super slow. So you need to, and then you get one update and then you do one more, uh, to get another update, you have to iterate over the entire data. And, you know, you might say that's, uh, that's not a big deal. I have only a thousand examples and my computer is from 2024. Uh, well, it turns out that a uh, thousand examples might be too little. What if your, the data that you're training on has, uh, uh, what was the size of the data set for chat GPT? Something like or GPT-3 or something, it was like 500 billion data points. 
if for getting one update of the parameters, you have to sum over 500 billion things, it's not going to really be efficient. And that's the reason uh, pretty much all optimization that's used in machine learning today does not use gradient descent directly, but uses something called stochastic optimization. In particular, uh, some extension of this idea of stochastic gradient descent. Today, we'll, look at, we'll be looking at stochastic gradient descent for SVM. So uh, because it's SVM, so the objective we are optimizing is this function j here. And we have given a training set x comma y, um, where x is consists of uh, feature vectors in d dimensions and y consists of uh, minus one or one. And uh, we'll initialize our weights to the zero vector, which is uh, a, a collection of d zeros. And we're going to proceed in epochs. Uh, I'm presenting a version of uh, stochastic gradient descent here that's slightly different from the version that for which there actually is a proof, or at least the first version for which there was a proof. This is the one that's uh, implemented, and this is the one that you will implement next. Uh, so you have learning procedures in epochs, and you have this for loops uh, from uh, that you decide to go t times. At the end of these three epochs, you are done and you return the final way. Inside each epoch, the simplest version of this algorithm says you pick a random example. You pick one. Oh, I see. Uh, it occurs to me that I'm presenting a version that first I'm presenting a version that's not implemented, that is typically not implemented for which we have a proof. Then I'll kind of talk about the version that you'll implement. So, so inside each epoch, what you do is you pick one random example, xi comma yi, from the training set. This example is chosen um, uh, by uh, uniformly at random from the set of examples that we have. You pretend then that this example is the entire data set that we have. This is all the data we have. Instead of having the, the, a big collection of examples of this thing, your entire data set consists of exactly one element, xi, yi. For that data set, you can compute, you can define the objective. If you had only that one example, you can define the objective, uh, SVM objective for that example. It will look something like half W transpose W plus C. You're taking a summation over one element. So we don't really have a summation times max of something like that. So you've gotten rid of the summation. So there's just one element. Let's call this objective J hat of W. This is uh, uh, your pretend objective, assuming that that entire data set got tossed out and you had only one example. Now, you can take the gradient of uh, uh, that objective at the current set of weights. And then you get some gradient that you compute. So this is the function that we had, and we can compute its gradient. And then you update the weights as if it was standard gradient descent. You just take a step in the direction opposite to the direction in which that uh, objective grows. This is the entirety of this epoch. After that, you go back to the top. Once again, you pick a random example. You pick a random example. It may be the same example. It may be a different one. You pretend that this time, this is the example that, that this is the entire data set. You create a new objective function. You take its derivative. You take a gradient step in the opposite direction and you keep it right. You do this enough number of times, enough being uh, something that we'll talk about later. And then you return the final range. This algorithm is called stochastic gradient descent because we are creating a stochastic. Oh, this is this is a mistake. There should be no men here. Um, this algorithm is called stochastic gradient descent because at a, in, inside this loop here, at any point, you are creating a stochastic approximation of the gradient. The true gradient was the sum over all gradients plus the 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 the, the w the gradient of w transpose w. Instead of the sum, you're taking 
just one element. So you're getting rid of the sum and you're creating a stochastic approximation of the true gradient. And uh, you know, you're randomly taking the step according to that example. The nice thing about stochastic gradient descent is that even though it seems like a hack, where you just take a, a random example, pretend that it's your entire data and you use that to make an update, it actually comes with guarantees. This, uh, this uh, algorithm is guaranteed to converge to the minimum of the true function, provided your learning rate uh, satisfies some property. And the reason for this is because your function is convex. If your function is convex, as t goes to infinity, as the number of steps you take keeps increasing, this particular, this, these three steps will take you to the minimum of the function closer, uh, pretty fast actually. Questions? Yeah. Why don't you just have a fine? You could. That's called a mini batch. In fact, that is exactly what's done in practice. And there is there are a few more practical things that we have to do to change this. Uh, in practice, this is not what you might implement. This is the version that was invented in, I think, 1953 or something. And then in practice, there is like quite a few changes that you would do, and we'll get to that uh, as we go along. Yeah. In the original version of the uh, of the algorithm. In the practical one, you will not do that. You will actually do something else, um, which you will, you can guess what we will do. It will look like a perceptron type update. Uh, perceptron type uh, loop setup. But this is the first sort of the theoretical version of stochastic uh, gradient descent. I saw a hand. Same question. Okay. Questions on Zoom? I can't tell if someone's typing on Zoom. Okay, I don't see a question, so I'll keep going. And if there's a question, I'll come back to it. So you might be, yeah, there's a question here. We will get there after step four. In fact, yeah, we'll get there at step four. So the next thing that I want to kind of uh, talk about is what's the difference between stochastic gradient descent and gradient descent. Uh, you can think of these functions that we are optimizing as a collection of these level curves. Uh, are people familiar with level curves? Um, if you live in Utah, you probably have to know this, right? So when you go hiking, you want to know the altitude. Uh, so essentially think of this as like a, a top view of the function that we are looking at. And every point on this, on the same sort of a curve has the same function value. Our goal is to go to the minimum of this thing. And gradient descent kind of follows a somewhat smoothish trajectory down the slope to get to the minimum, which is nice. In contrast, stochastic gradient descent, because there is randomness inherent in the, in the optimizer, takes a somewhat more, say, shall we say, interesting route. I, here's a cartoon version of it. Maybe the first version, at the first point, even though the gradient of this function points in this direction, the, the example that you pick as an approximation to approximate the gradient takes us slightly for, in, in what might look like the wrong direction. Then it takes us away. Then it keeps going. Eventually, this will converge. Uh, it, it will take many, many more updates. It's like a, I've seen it being described as a uh, a, a sort of a drunk walk into the valley. Um, and e each update is super small computationally, is really inexpensive. However, the number of updates might actually be large. And what is also guaranteed by, uh, you know, formally, is that in expectation, this random sequence of steps will take us to the exact same point that the original uh, gradient descent would have taken us um, a little bit more smoothly. The difference being every step in this process 
is much more expensive because you are summing over the entire data. Questions? Yeah? Yes. Um, I know you, you said that SPD and JSON is the fact that it's a fourth number of the running rate is too low. Yes. Does the running rate need to be lower for stochastic gradient descent? Does it need to be that? Uh, there's a formal theorem for stochastic gradient descent. Um, for gradient descent, if you have a quadratic function, just a quadratic function, meaning like f of x equals x squared, then you'll be you'll take you'll be taken to the minimum very quickly. Um, so there is like a few different ways to interpret that. Uh, in gradient descent, you are essentially approximating the function as a quadratic because you're taking the first derivative and then taking uh, uh, at any point and then taking steps to go down that. Uh, thing. We can talk about this offline, but for stochastic gradient descent, there's very clear sort of understanding of what the what properties need to be satisfied by the learning rate. And turns out that even though there's like a formal statement, there are many, 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 many learning rate strategies that satisfy that. And even that is not sufficient because in practice, gradient descent is a stochastic gradient descent is really the simplest of the optimizers that exist out there. And uh, uh, there are many extensions of this that involve ideas like momentum and such things, which we'll talk about with, when we talk about neural networks, um, which make this whole thing looks, look rather simplistic. But in practice, this works reasonably well. Uh, there's a question, is the worst case bad? Uh, I don't really know what the, whether the worst case is bad because the convergence guarantee is in expectation. So in expectation, we'll get to the, the, the right value. One of the nice things that we do know about stochastic gradient descent is that if your objective function is convex, or if your function you're optimizing is convex, then you will reasonably quickly get to a reasonably good point. Uh, and often that's all we need for machine learning. We don't need to get to the absolute, uh, you know, minimum of that function with infinitesimal or infinite precision. Because remember the function that we are optimizing itself is a surrogate for the true error that we want to minimize. We talked about that in the last lecture. The true error we want to minimize is the zero one loss, which is not differentiable. So we have a, a approximation or a surrogate for that, that we are optimizing. And there is so much other sort of noise in the system. There is noise in the data, there's noise in your labeling, there's noise in your features, that getting to the absolute minimum of this objective doesn't seem to matter much. You can, all you need is to get to the ballpark and we are good. Okay, so finally, now we'll get to the question that uh, several of you have been asking, what about the hinge loss? The hinge loss is not uh, a differentiable function. So how can we use this whole thing with that? So the, problem with implementing stochastic gradient descent for SVM is the derivative of this SVM objective. The derivative of this SVM objective is, uh, the, or the SVM objective is not differentiable because the hinge loss is not differentiable because max is not a differentiable function. To get around that, we need to take a bit of a detour. We need to uh, visit a, a, an idea called the subgradient and subderivative and sub-differentiability of functions. So subgradients are a generalization of the concept of gradients to uh, certain types of non-differentiable functions, not all non-differentiable functions. And the uh, intuition here is uh, when we talk about convex functions, and I, uh, I said one way of defining a convex function is to say that every tangent plane uh, for that function lies entirely below that function. So that, that makes the function convex. We can also think about uh, something called a subtangent. A subtangent is any hyperplane that lies below the function at a point and touches the function at that point. So if it touches the function there and lies entirely below, we'll call it a subtangent. All tangents are subtangents because this tangent line lies below the function entirely and touches the function at that point. 
It turns out for a differentiable function, there's only one subtangent, the tangent itself. The subgradient is simply the slope of that line or that plane or that hyperplane is the is the uh, direction that defines that hyperplane. And just like the gradient can be seen as the slope of the tangent. Yes. No, I mean a hyperplane that lies entirely below the function. The, the tangent is a line, right? You can think of it as a line in two dimensions. In three dimensions, it's a plane. In four dimensions, it's a hyperplane. In high, any number of dimensions. For a convex function that is differentiable. We will get there. We'll look at this example here. Let's look at another example. This example, by the way, is uh, from a uh, uh, lecture and a book by Stephen Boyd. Uh, Stephen Boyd's book on convex optimization is seriously amazing. If this sort of stuff excites you, I would encourage you to take a look at that book. So here's a function. This function has this one point here, which is not differential. This, uh, formally, a subgradient is a vector g uh, to some function. So we are given some function f. In this case, this is a, this curve represents the function. And at any point, we can define this thing called g, which is a subgradient, if it satisfies the following point. At all other points y, let's call this f of y and y, the value of the function is more f of y is more than f of x plus g transpose y minus x. This is basically a line. Imagine that x is a fixed point, a given point. So f of x plus g transpose y minus x is the equation of a line that passes through f of x. When x when y, so I can define the line is some constant, let's call it c plus G transpose y minus c. This is a here the variable is y. Oh no, not c. Um, f of c. So some constant f of c plus g transpose g is a vector g transpose y minus uh, some constant. Now when y equals c, this becomes f of c, which means when y equals in this case I'm using c instead of x because x might seem like a variable, but for our case now, let's say x is a constant. And y equals that point, then this line passes through f of x or f of c. The definition says at all other points, that is not the point in quest concern, the, the line f of x or f of c plus g transpose y minus c lies entirely below f of y, the value of the function. The function lies above that line. This satisfies the definition of the subtangent. The subtangent is a line that lies entirely below the function at all points, except maybe at that one point where it actually touches the line. When x e when when y equals c uh, at the point c, the value of the function is f of c. Questions? Yes. It, Kind of does, uh, then you lose this idea that uh, at all points, uh, this y cannot be all points. You have to say in some neighborhood and you have to define those things a little carefully. So let's consider these two points in this example, x1 and x2. At the point x1, the function is differentiable. So I can write down an equation of this line here. That line is f of x1 plus some vector g1 transpose x minus x1. g1 is the slope of that line. And g1 is simply defined to be the gradient of that function f at the point x1 by construction. The gradient is also a subgradient. But the more interesting case is the point x2. In x2, there are multiple lines that we can draw that are in completely below the function and pass through that point. There are an infinite number of lines. This picture shows 
two of them, the slope of the first line is G2, the slope of the second line is G3. And by definition, all of these lines or hyperplanes are defined to be subtangents. And all the slopes of this, these uh, hyperplanes are called subgradients. So, subgradient is actually not a single vector, but a set of vectors. In this case, it's actually an infinite set of vectors. Or if the function is differentiable, it's a set containing exactly one element. Questions about the idea of a subgradient? If it's differentiable, that's the, there's only one subgradient, which is the gradient itself. If it is not differentiable, you'll have an infinite number of subgradients because you can think of lines that are kind of rotating uh, uh, along, but passing through this point here. And all of them are subtangents and their slopes are all subgradients. This is like, a, a, you know, technically it's an extension of the concept of a gradient. Because if your function is purely differentiable, all gradients are, uh, are the subgradients. If your function is not differentiable, then you have this thing. Notice that I still demand that the function should be continuous. Um, there is, this does not excuse uh, uh, the cases where your function is not continuous. Any questions? No, in fact, what we'll talk about next is uh, why do we care about this? It turns out stochastic gradient descent works if you pick any subgradient. So uh, we'll talk about that very in a little bit, but uh, I want to talk about this how to get the subgradient of this max function because that's the only sort of non differentiable thing that uh, uh, we care about. If I draw the, uh, uh, the the plot for this, it may look something like the there's a line here, and then there's another line here. And if you are, let's say that this is my x, some x. I mean, it's not the same as the x here. This is max of of c comma x minus x, let's say. That's this function here, where this value is c. Okay, now, um, yeah. So let's say that we are on this side. Anywhere here, that line is, of course, differentiable. The gradient of that is zero, right? Anywhere here, that line is also differentiable. So the gradient of that is in that case, it's just one. So both of these, those things are easy. The only interesting point is somewhere here. In that, this in, inside that point there. In that case, the subgradients for that would be every line that goes like this. So the subtangents for that might be lines that look like that, like that. The entire spectrum of lines that are between those would be some um, tangent for that particular, uh, for this expression at that point. And you can pick any one of them. We can be kind of a little bit more uh, strategic with choosing one. And the strategic part comes from what we know this, what is easy to implement. The easiest thing to do is first of all, notice that. If you are on this side, we use this function. If you are on this side, we use this function. So whichever function is the bigger one at any point, at this point we use, let's call this, this is a meeting of two functions, right? So whichever function is bigger, we use that uh, thing to compute the gradient. So if we call this thing F1 and this thing is F2, if F1 is greater than F2, then we know that we are in this region. So we use F1 to compute the gradient. If F2 is greater, we use this one. So all you have to do to compute the subgradient of the max function is first solve the max 
pick which of the two things are bigger and take the gradient of that thing. The only point that matters is the meeting point and you can pick either one of those functions, it doesn't matter. Because at that point, solving the max is picking, both those functions take the same value. So you just pick one of those two functions and you're done. So the general strategy for computing the uh, subgradient of the max function is you first solve the max, find which side of the max of the, is zero bigger than one minus y w transpose x or lesser. If zero is bigger, you compute the gradient of zero. If zero is lesser, then you compute the gradient of one minus y w transpose x, and that gives you the subgradient. So in this case, the gradient of this expression is, uh, let's derive this a little, uh, one step at a time. The gradient of this is first, we need to compute the derivative of this with respect to w. Though if you've not seen uh, this, uh, you know, the uh, literature on how to compute derivatives of these vector valued functions, I highly, highly recommend uh, searching for something called the matrix cookbook. It is fantastic. It's like a great resource for just giving you recipes for if you need to compute this derivative, you apply this strategy. If you need to compute that derivative, you apply that strategy. One of those is if you have W transpose anything that is, um, uh, yeah, the, the answer is you just take out the W and multiply by two. Or you just take out, the, take uh, you know, get rid of the W. Um, there's a little bit more nuance to that. Basically the gradient of this expression is simply W because there's a half, it's like, if I have the number W square and the derivative of that with respect to W is exactly W, right? W transpose W behaves like that. So the derivative of the first term is simply W. And then we have plus C times. Now we need to first figure out how to deal with the max. If zero is greater than one minus, minus Y W transpose X, then the, the max, the function is defined by zero. So we need to take the derivative of zero. So it's the derivative of zero is just zero. If zero is, I don't care about, in this case, well, we need to take the gradient of this expression here. That is simply minus y times x. So that takes, that's basically what I have written a little bit more cleanly here. Uh, inside this box, uh, inside the uh, the thing that I've set. So, if the derivative of uh, if, if one minus y w transpose x is more than zero, then you take the, 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 the gradient becomes w minus c y i x i. Otherwise, the gradient is just w. Questions about this? We have all the pieces we need to put together the uh, the algorithm that minimizes the FPM objective. So, if there are no questions, I'm going to start putting the pieces together. Let's put the pieces together, and you can think of questions as we go along. So, let's. Uh, build up stochastic subgradient descent for SPM. So we are given a training set uh, consisting of pairs of examples with labels, where examples are d-dimensional feature vectors and labels are minus one over one. We initialize our weight vector to zero, which is a d-dimensional vector. That's the, and we keep updating it. And eventually that's the thing that we'll return. Learning proceeds in epochs. Uh, and we have to decide up front either how many epochs we wanted to run or a strategy for how, when we are going to stop. The simplest thing to do is just to decide how, how long this will run. So let's say we run this for three epochs. For each training example, and now I'm presenting a version of stochastic gradient descent, which is slightly different from what we saw before. Earlier, I said, you take one example and you pretend that's your uh, entire data set, and then you just uh, take a, a gradient step. Instead of taking an example randomly, I'm actually going to iterate through the entire data. This way, we get to see all the examples. 
at least once in each epoch. So for each training example, x i y i in your training data, we will update the weights by taking an, a step opposite in the opposite direction of the stochastic gradient. The gradient is defined exactly how we just saw it. It's not a gradient, it's actually the subgradient. Now, this update step, it turns out, has two parts to it. First, we need to check if max of one minus uh, y, if zero is uh, bigger or smaller than one minus y w transpose x. If the if one minus y w transpose x is less than zero, then we are on this side. So the update becomes w is w minus gamma times w. Otherwise, w is w minus this quantity here. So we will let's write this a little more cleanly. If instead of saying one minus y w transpose x is greater than zero, I can just rewrite this as y w transpose x is less than or equal to one. If y w transpose x is less than or equal to one, I update my weights. So what is this update? How did I get this? It is simply w min minus the learning rate gamma. This time I'm using gamma for learning rate. W minus c y i x i. I can take the w common, and so I get one minus gamma times w plus c gamma y i x i, and that's what we have here. So if y w transpose x is less than one, then I update the weights by doing what I just wrote, and if it's not, I update the weights by just multiplying it with one minus the learning rate. And notice that I'm doing this for every training example. And this is the difference from the, the official version of stochastic gradient descent that I described a little while earlier, rather than randomly picking an example and iterating through the entire training set. After this is done, I just return the final weight uh, at, the, uh, at, the, at the end. One thing that I have left under specified here is how do you pick the learning rate? And we'll talk about that in a little bit. One thing that is not mentioned here at all is a very, very important step that needs to happen right there. Before the start of every epoch, you need to shuffle the example. You need to shuffle the, the data because uh, that kind of is a pretend way of randomly uh, uh, picking an example. If you shuffle the example in the next iteration, you will not go through the examples in the same order. So you have this randomness. And that is actually, it turns out, uh, it, it becomes important. Uh, uh, to actually get good performance. And if you want, you can try to turn off that randomness, that shuffling step when you implement it to see what happens. And you might notice that the model does not really converge that well. So questions about the algorithm before we talk about the learning rates. Yes. Um, what is C? Sorry? C. What is C? Sorry. C is the exact same thing that we had in the original SVM objective, which uh, we, uh, let's see if I can pull that up here. See, we had these two terms in the last. There is the, the so we have the regularizer and then we have the change loss. And the C is like a trade-off parameter that says, how much do I want the, the relative importance of the regularizer and their loss. If the regularizer, if C is really, really small, it says the loss on the training data, the error on, that you get on the training data is not as important as the regularizer. So that can let, lead the model to underfit. It essentially it passes off more and more examples because it's okay for the model to ignore examples. If C is extremely large, infinite, in fact, if C is infinite, what happens is, or pretend that the C is extremely large, practically infinite. Then it says, whatever you do, I need to find a W that minimum that gives super high importance to that term. So you better overfit the data. You better perfectly separate the data if, if at all possible. So that's the thing. This the C comes from the SVM uh, objective. It's not part of the optimizer. Other question? Yes. Uh, can you just hold on? I it turns out my battery is dying. I should pick you mind. I forgot to bring my charger.
sorry what were you saying so essentially you're saying you can take a step that is so big that it minimizes the function for that one example you could but that might end up ruining things for the other example so you may not want to do that so you have to be careful that's a good uh, segue into learning rates the stochastic gradient descent algorithm comes with the following guarantee with enough iterations as the number of iterations increases to infinity this um, objective will converge sorry the, the object the, the weight will converge to some weights that uh, are the minimum in expectation expectation over the randomness you can't say that it is guaranteed to converge because there is an implicit randomness here provided the learning rates satisfy a certain property called summable sorry square summable but not summable what that means is all your learning rates of step sizes gamma t should be positive if you add the all the learning rates from zero to infinite infinity this expression here more so let's make this n as this thing tends to infinity as the number of steps goes to infinity this becomes infinite um, and however that's this thing here the sum of the step sizes go from uh, uh, one to infinite is itself infinite i don't know what i have written here over t is one to one uh, the sum of step sizes from the sum of the squares of those learning rates should be should not become infinity so let me sum up the three steps of three conditions all your learning rates are positive if you add up the learning rates to infinity they should be the the, the converging the, the sum of those learning rates should become infinite but if you add up the squares of the learning rates then you should not get infinity and there are many functions that satisfy the property or many learning rate schedules that satisfy the property a simple one is something like this simply you pick an initial learning rate called gamma zero and at every time step t the learning rate is simply gamma zero divided by one plus t so gamma zero becomes a hyperparameter another one is something that's slightly more sophisticated that involves the parameter c that we saw in the objective this i have seen implemented in some machine learning library that's why i put this here um, and there are many many versions many 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 different functions that satisfy these properties any learning rates that satisfy these properties will do the 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 guarantee that we get is uh, it takes the form of how many iterations do you need to take how many steps do you need to take to get within how many updates do you need to make to get to within epsilon of the true optimum and stochastic gradient descent takes order of d divided by epsilon steps whereas gradient descent takes order of n d times log 1 over epsilon now let's talk about these things a little bit more carefully if you have n examples if your data set has n examples and you have d dimensional features with gradient descent you need to go take order of n the number the number of steps you take depends on the size of the data set and the dimensionality but in terms of the accuracy that you care about all you, you only need to take log of one over epsilon steps on the other hand with stochastic gradient descent the in, as a function of the error you need to take one over epsilon so this square so from if you go from if you compare those two terms as a function of the epsilon alone for gradient descent it's log one over epsilon which is a much smaller number than one over epsilon so it seems like sgd wins but notice in terms of the dimensionality the same sort of linear dependence on the dimensionality is there but notice that the data size dep dependence doesn't show up stochastic gradient descent gets to within epsilon of the objective independent of the size of the data which is incredible so this uh, you know the, the 
the, the, that's really the promise that you get. It doesn't matter how much data you have. If your data set is really large, it is better to do SGD because the size of the data set doesn't figure in this uh, uh, in the number of steps you need to get to within epsilon. Uh, there are other there are some subtleties involved, and this is stochastic optimization is in some sense the uh, most popular sort of machine learning uh, uh, optimizer that gets used today. And there are many variants of this. Um, every few years, a new named variant shows up, which is kind of, which builds on stochastic gradient descent. So you, so you see names like Adegrad, there's something that there's a concept called momentum that uh, uh, we'll talk about later. There's next Nestros accelerated gradient, Adam, RMS prop, all of these. Uh, today, for instance, the standard, the most common uh, optimizer that's used, I think, is Adam. Is that right? Adam, or actually some variant of Adam, gets used uh, by most papers that uh, in the space, you know, that use deep learning, for instance. Um, but they kind of build on the same idea. They take the same idea and add extra bells and whistles so that the, the gradient does not change too much, or you kind of have a instead of remember instead of taking the grade uh, the only the current example to compute the gradient, you have a memory of the past gradient so that you take a smoother path down the down the slope and such things. Questions about gradient slash stochastic gradient descent? So uh, just a sort of a historical note here. Uh, for support vector machines, it turns out that the, the historically stochastic gradient descent was not the most popular algorithm that was used. I think there were certain research groups that actively suggested that uh, stochastic gradient descent should be used for SVMs, but uh, popular libraries did not use that. And uh, uh, I'm blanking on the name of the algorithm right now, but there was uh, there were algorithms that used second second order information. Gradients are just the first derivative. Algorithms that relied on second derivatives or minor uh, approximations of those that were popular. And I think around 2008 or 2009 is when, or maybe seven to eight is when it became clear that as the sizes of the data set get bigger and bigger, we cannot, um, we, we don't have a choice. We need to use stochastic gradient descent. If you're interested in, uh, uh, oh, there's a question. If your data set is small, is gradient descent okay? I would still say just use stochastic gradient descent. You are better off just using stochastic gradient descent simply because you will get to the, uh, it, it, it does not really matter. It does not, you don't need to use the, uh, the gradient descent. So if you're interested in this thing, I would recommend searching for a paper whose title has the name Pegasus, S-O-S, with an O here. Uh, this was from 2007 or eight, I can't remember, which uh, uh, proves these bounds and such things. Questions? Yes. The gradient, yeah, basically, you need to iterate over the example, yeah. Okay, now I want to kind of uh, switch uh, topics or actually just take you back to the first half of the semester because I want to compare the uh, eventual stochastic subgradient descent algorithm that we came up with, with the perceptron algorithm. This is the SGD algorithm that we saw. Uh, for SVM, where we have uh, for every training example, there's actually a shuffle here. For every training example, we have this update here. Now, if you compare this against the perceptron update that we have already seen, let's maybe go through this sort of uh, um, what the changes exercise here. Uh, first one is. With perceptron, if y times w transpose x was negative, 
you made an update. Uh, 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 the shape of the update was essentially very similar. You have some W plus yi xi. There is a learning rate. There's an extra C term here, which is not in perceptron. And then there is this extra one minus gamma term. This sort of a slightly more involved update happened for the perceptron when YW transpose X was negative. For an SVM, you say it's not just negative, but if it's less than one. Now, why is that interesting? Remember, YW transpose X being negative is when the perceptron makes a mistake. So the perceptron makes a mistake, it updates. For an SVM, we are saying YW transpose X, even if it's positive, but between zero and one, you still need to make a mistake. Those are for examples that are within the margin. The margin is one. If an example is correct, but within the margin, you still pretend that it's a mistake and make an update. So that's the first sort of a qualitative difference. The second difference here is when this mistake condition is not triggered. For the perceptron, when there's no mistake, nothing changes in the weights. The weights remain the same. For SVM, if the mistake condition is not triggered, you still have an update. What you do is you multiply the weights by one minus gamma. So uh, there's a question that I'll get to in a bit. Uh, you multiply the weights by one minus gamma and uh, what's going on there? Remember gamma, yes. Can you speak up? You decrease the importance of those points. Yeah, so, so the suggestion is you decrease the importance of those points. But notice that this update does not have x at all. So there is no x. You're just scaling the w's down. Can someone else, or maybe you, think about, can someone suggest why? What's going on there? So the one suggestion on Zoom is, is it like averaging? I, some, I couldn't understand what you said. So, there is, so there's a suggestion that it comes from regularization. And did you want to say something else? So there's a suggestion that you are preferring weights with lesser values. I'm going to give a very boring answer here. Remember, uh, I'll give you a first, first a boring answer and then I'll try to kind of spice it up. So remember that your objective is half W transpose W plus C times something like this, right? Let's consider what happens when Y W transpose X is greater than one meaning this condition is not satisfied. So we are inside that else part of the thing. If YW transpose X is more than one, from the geometric point of view, what we know is that that particular point XY or X is outside the margin. It's correctly classified. YW transpose X is positive. Not only is the example correctly classified, it is outside the margin. So there is no reason to update anything. Importantly, that also means that that particular example for that particular example, the hinge loss is zero because YW transpose X is more than one, max of zero comma that one minus YW transpose X is zero. So there is no loss on that example. Can we do something else? Well, we can. Our goal is to minimize this whole thing. If we multiply W by one minus gamma, gamma is a number between zero and one. One minus gamma is also a number between zero and one. So what happens to W transpose W? This becomes, after the update, 1 minus gamma square W transpose W. Sorry, not 1 minus gamma. Yeah, 1 minus gamma square W transpose W. Gamma is a number between 0 and 1. 1 minus gamma is a number between 0 and 1. Its square is also a number between 0 and 1. So the first term here, which we never had in perceptron, uh, well, we'll come to that later. The first term reduces in value. What does it mean when the first term reduces in value? W transpose W becoming smaller is equivalent to saying one divided by W transpose W becomes larger. 
1 divided by w transpose w becoming larger is essentially saying the margin becomes bigger. So if your example is correctly classified already, let's use this opportunity to make the margin a little bigger. If the example is incorrectly classified, then you still do that margin. You, you, it's called shrinking. You, sh you still shrink the w's and add the x just like you did to the perceptron. Did you have a question? Yes. Yeah, I guess you could see the product is the margin form. Is it that same method that changes the direction of the class by right? It does not change the direction. It just, in some sense, you can, like a pictorial version of this is you can think of this as you're making the margin bigger and then zooming out so that uh, the, 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 the value of that, the closest point, the y w transpose x, uh, for the closest point is still value equal to one. So there is a scaling that's also say, that's compensating the thing. Loosely speaking, the, when the norm of the weight increases, you should think of it as the margin increase. Yeah? What's the difference between the SPM and average margin of so first of all, the average perceptron does not have a regularizer, right? So there's no regularizer there. Um, the margin is, is, once you start introducing a margin into the perceptron, you start getting something in that looks very much like the SVM, except this sort of auto scaling of the margin does not happen. You still have to pick a hyperparameter, whereas here it's picked for you. That's the big difference. So now I want to go back to this question that uh, came up. Why would anyone use an perceptron if SVM is can generalize better by maximizing the margin? The answer is uh, it's not a very clear choice because once you use averaging with perceptron, what averaging does to perceptron is, or actually the voted perceptron, which averaging is supposed to simulate, the voted perceptron gives back guarantees to the perceptron algorithm. Averaging gives generalization to the perceptron just like regularization does to the SVM. So if you use average perceptron, you still get generalization. You, if you use my regularization with the SVM, you get generalization. So it's not clear which of these is the best. Here's another way to think about it. The perceptron, it turns out, also minimizes, is actually the perceptron algorithm, and I'll leave this as an exercise. The perceptron algorithm is actually minimizing a different loss function. The SPM minimizes the hinge loss, which is what we just uh, looked at for the entirety of uh, last week or the, this week. Last week, we are, we are on Tuesday, yeah. Turns out the perceptron is minimizing another loss function called the perceptron loss. The perceptron loss is simply max of zero comma minus y w transpose x. There is no one here. That term doesn't exist. The other difference in the perceptron loss is there is no regularizer. The exercise I want you to try out is everything that we talked about stochastic gradient descent and subgradient such and such thing. I want to instant, I want you to instantiate to this loss function. So just this, there's no regularizer. Take this loss function, take the subgradient of that, and plug it into this sort of a gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent framework that we developed before, you should get back the perceptron algorithm or the batch perceptron algorithm. Very quickly summarizing SVM from an optimization point of view, our goal is to minimize regularized hinge loss. And the standard or the most common way of doing this is to use uh, stochastic gradient descent. It's really fast because the runtime doesn't, uh, runtime to get to with an epsilon of the objective doesn't depend on the number of examples. It's instructive to derive this and then compare against the perceptron algorithm. Uh, the perceptron does, does not explicitly maximize the margin, does not have a regularizer, but there are variants that can do all of these things. At which point, these two algorithms start looking a bit like each other. Uh, there's some sort of a, uh, massaging that you need to do to talk about convergence. I really didn't talk about that, right? I just said run it to T steps. What is T? Should it be 100? Should it be 1,000? Um, in practice, you have to kind of, uh, it depends on the data set. It depends on the difficulty of the task and all that. 
um, and you you may have to decide use uh, 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 you know a validation set or something like that to decide when to stop or you you yeah you, you can use cross validation and such things. Turns out this is not the only optimization algorithm that exists. In particular, for the what's called the linear SPM, there's a, another optimization strategy called the dual coordinate descent, which we are not going to talk about because we will not talk about the concept of duals. Um, but if you have used this library called Liblinear, or if you've used, I think, scikit-learn, uh, which internally calls Liblinear, it's actually using dual coordinate descent. Questions about SVM? This will be the last thing that we'll talk about. Yes. No. The, so remember, it's not the margin that's one, but the functional margin that's one, just the numerator. So you don't need to do anything anymore. Um, after the training is done, all the prediction is it's just another linear classifier. And you just uh, use it as as you would, for example, the weight from Poseta. That whole exercise that we saw with scaling the weights was mostly uh, an, a, a sort of a, uh, a pedagogical tool to derive this idea that instead of maximizing the margin explicitly, we can minimize the norm of the weight such that the closest example has a functional margin of one. But once we, we, we with the slack variables and the other sort of uh, thing where we move from a constrained to an unconstrained version of the problem, we've kind of moved a little far from that, but the intuition still remains that norm, not, uh, minimizing the norm of the weights maximizes the margin. We are at 1.43 and uh, I can either start a new topic now with uh, with no hope of even going past the title slide, or I can uh, wait for another question and then wrap up after that. Yes. 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 So you want to expand the features? Yes. It does. So SVM, the version that we saw, does not change the features at all. It's just a linear classifier in the features. Support vector machines by itself is nothing more than just a linear classifier in that feature space. Now, it turns out the idea of support vector machine was closely followed up with a neat extension that uses this notion of duals that allows us to think about nonlinear classifiers. If you are interested in that, you need to look up this topic called kernels. Kernels are simply dot product in high dimensional spaces that can be computed efficiently. That's really a loser definition of that. And the invention of or the, the, the recognition that kernels applies to support vector machines uh, was so, you know, these two ideas were so tightly coupled that very, very many people assume that SVMs equals kernel machines, but kernels are a more general concept. Unfortunately, we do not have the time to cover that topic at all. Uh, there was an earlier version of the machine learning class where I taught that topic. So there's some material on the class website. You can look that up. It's really fun, but it just gives us learning algorithms that are actually much harder to implement and uh, uh, reason about. So it's not it's seeing less and less use uh, lately. But yeah, yes. You could, it could be your one thing that we did not cover in class, which you can find a good implementation of it. Um, you could, yeah. All right, um, let's wrap up. Uh, we are a minute over time. On Thursday, I'm going to talk about loss minimization and such things.